when it comes to traveling by air, emissions historically have not been that good. Air travel is responsible for a sizable chunk of our planet's emissions. And the higher a plane flies, the more efficient it becomes and the less fuel it uses. So the better it is for the environment per passenger mile. But there are lots of short trips made by airplanes around the world that can't be carried out at high altitude because the actual distances being traveled are so short that it's not easy or practical to go to a high altitude because you spend your entire trip climbing and then coming back down again, or perhaps not even getting very high at all. And that puts extra strain on the planes from a mechanical perspective and causes a whole load of headaches. Now, traditionally, the answer to short distance plane travel is to not take it. If you can drive somewhere rather than fly, well, that is a smarter option. If you can take a train, that's even better. But there are certain applications where it's not possible to drive, like here in Vancouver, BC, Canada, where there are large bodies of water that need to be crossed. And the alternative to taking a short plane ride is to take a multi-hour boat ride. And that causes a bit of a headache for companies like Harbour Air. Harbour Air likes to say that it's been operating the original urban air mobility service for the last 40 years with its fleet of float planes. They fly all over the region. They offer the ways to connect communities together that would otherwise be very much not easy to get between. But Harbour Air is cognizant of the challenges that lay ahead, the need for us to make a cleaner, greener, safer, smarter, and more equitable world. And so it's been working on a prototype project to turn its entire fleet of float planes to electric float planes. And I'm here today with Erica Holtz from Harbour Air. And I've got an electric float plane right behind me, Erica. Thanks for joining me today. I'm excited to have you guys here and share what we've been doing. So this is a prototype plane that you've been engineering for a couple of years now, Five years right? now. Five years. And it's working in collaboration with a whole load of different stakeholders. And the goal is for you all to be a 100% electric fleet by 2027, right? We think that we will have an introduction in 2027. That's when our first commercial offering of the electric beaver would be. And once the technology has advanced a bit more, probably around 2030, we'll be able to start looking at the other aircraft in the fleet. Tell me some of the technical specs for the e-beaver. All right, so the original beaver, the piston beaver is a 450 horsepower aircraft that carries six passengers and a single pilot. Uh, we replaced everything firewall forward uh, with the Magni 500 um, electric engine. It is capable of 500, and kilo 500 kilowatts, but we derated it to 336 kilowatts because we didn't want to change the performance of the aircraft. We wanted to, start to keep the base aircraft as similar as possible, uh, just change the propulsion system. If you limit the changes, it's easier to get to certification. So we changed out the engine, and we installed a completely lithium ion based battery pack. So the, the aircraft is fully electric at this point. Now the E-Beaver is a plane that's primarily designed for very short distance operation. You're not planning on offering services halfway across Canada. You're offering services to tie communities together. So you fly to Vancouver Island, you fly to other destinations in the area to offer people who would otherwise be faced with a multi-hour boat trip the ability to come to Vancouver and traverse the region. For all those reasons, you talked about how the short haul flights uh, are bad for the environment. The short haul flights are what actually make this a viable commercial opportunity. So because we don't climb to high altitudes, because we don't go to long distances, our energy requirements are actually quite low. Most piston aircraft don't carry all the fuel on board that they can. Usually they carry only the amount of fuel that they need to get to the distance that they're going so they can maximize the payload for the passengers. So with this aircraft, what we'll, we'll have is we'll still have the ability to fly about 80% of the routes in our network with five or six passengers on this aircraft. So we can complete all of our missions and do it completely emission-free. 
Now, your original piston aircraft, your Beavers, they are all float planes, which means they're designed for, for taking off and landing on water. And they have a pretty rigorous maintenance schedule. We know in the electric car world that electric vehicles require far fewer trips to the dealership for regular maintenance. Is that something that that we can look forward to with planes like the e-beaver? Absolutely. Um, the piston engine actually requires a significant amount of maintenance, more so than our turbine aircraft. Uh, a lot of our, what we call our 100 hour inspection. So every 100 hour, the aircraft has to go in for inspection, including the engine. A good 30 to 40% of that is all inspections on the engine. That will be completely eliminated with the change to an electric engine. We aren't positive what the uh, actual inspection requirements are going to be. It's what we're working on with Magniacs. But the original engine had a 1600 hour uh, TBO, time before overhaul, where you had to take it off and completely overhaul the engine. We're expecting a 10,000 uh, TBO on the electric engine. Now, at the moment, obviously eBeaver is just a, a single prop plane and you have both the piston driven single prop planes, but then you also have the turbo prop twin engine planes as well. Is that something eventually that you're hoping to replace with electric drive as well? I think uh, for us, what we're looking at, when we look at the technology, we believe we can get like the nine seater size. So the single otter and the caravan could go to fully electric. When it comes to the twin otter, the 19 seater, uh, we're concerned that the batteries won't have the energy density that we need to go fully electric with that aircraft, but we can take the same technology and at least put in hybrid. We could have uh, one electric engine and one gas engine, or we can look at uh, hydrogen as an option. Fully electric for the twin otter is is not in the foreseeable future, but you never know with the developments that they're making, right. it could become viable uh, in the future. And it's worth pointing out for those who are not air aircraft nerds, that the majority of the of the energy used in a flight is in the initial stage of flight, actually taking off and getting up to, to altitude, right? Well, actually, um, it uses a lot of power in the beginning, um, but the most, you save a lot of the energy for the crews. And this is one of the reasons that this aircraft became commercially viable for us, is that when uh, the original aircraft requires 62% of maximum power to maintain level flight, uh, so you're using 62% of the 450 horse just to keep the butt in the air. For this aircraft, we only need 41% of the maximum power. So that is, we went from an eight minute cruise when we were first originally designing it to a 33 minute cruise based on that performance improvement alone. So you talked about some of the, the changes to, to your in-flight capabilities. Let's talk about the, the actual control dynamics of the plane and the controls for the pilots. This is a retrofit of an existing plane. So I'm assuming that all of the controls from a pilot perspective are the same. It's very close. Our design philosophy from the beginning was to change as little as possible. Pilots don't deal well with change and neither do mechanics. Uh, so the external of the aircraft is identical to the baseline, except for the elongated pointier nose. Uh, inside the aircraft in the cockpit, we left as many of the controls uh, as original as possible. Um, there's a couple of changes on the control of the engine. Uh, there's a throttle lever and the, the propeller lever, but we got rid of the mixture control. And then there's a new display for the engine instrumentation. But other than that, well, and the switches are slightly different, but we left as much as possible alone. So the pilots, if you talk to them, they say it's, it's pretty close to flying the original Beaver, a little bit of differences, and it's a bit sportier. Although the control surfaces sound as if they're, they're pretty similar, what about the certification time? Because what a lot of people don't realize is that if you are a commercial pilot, you have to be certified on every plane that you fly commercially. So tell me about that. Right, so uh, some aircraft require type courses um, for you to have very specific training. For the electric aircraft, uh, we look at it more as you need to understand the, the system. Um, for the pilots, that is something that's still being negotiated with the regulators as to how much training needs to happen. Does it require any kind of type course? Is it an endorsement to their license, kind of like float plane, seaplane rating, right? Do you get an electric rating? They're having some conversations about that. For the mechanics, we really think that the, the only training they really need is about the safety of working with high voltage. Uh, the aircraft is very simple. And the electric engine really is quite simple. Like having a type course on how to work on an electric motor is kind of silly. It would be over in about an hour, right? So we're hoping that more about the safety of the system and understanding how the battery electric works is all that would be required for training. 
if you happen to be out and about and you, you spy a prototype test car driving along, it's pretty obvious it's a prototype test car. It's got the camouflage on. But then if you, you know, if you spot one charging and you look inside, you'll see sometimes extra dials and buttons that aren't there. You'll also sometimes see the back seat area where you'd want people to sit to be absolutely full of gubbins, whether it's extra batteries, charging stuff or whatever. Looking at the eBeaver, that's kind of where you're at, right? Exactly. We're using this as our experimental test bed. We are testing out components. We're testing out different architectures. The first engine that was put in here, electric engine, was not very efficiently built. It doesn't drive any of the accessories off of it. We have two different oil systems in there. So one of our, our issues with it was we couldn't put any of the batteries up front, which meant to keep to maintain weight and balance, we couldn't put any batteries in the back, so the batteries have to go where the passengers would be. But since this is experimental and we're just using it to prove out the different technologies, it didn't matter because we're not going to be carrying any passengers anyways. What it lets us do are things like, do we want to bus our battery strings together or do we want a single lane of batteries per inverter? Which architecture is better? Can we find a DC to DC converter that doesn't have a whole bunch of electrical noise that wipes out our radios? And can we can we integrate that in there with a bust or non-bust system? We get to test out though all that different technology. And in fact, from this aircraft, uh, when we move to our certification prototype, there's only one component on here that we're going to maintain, and that's the propeller. People would be very upset with me if we didn't talk about charging. Huh. So, like any electric vehicle, the eBeaver needs to charge. Obviously, float planes can't just rock up at the local supermarket and, and plug into to a DC charging station there. So tell me a little bit about charging, uh, current range that you're shooting for and, and all of that good stuff. Excellent. Um, yeah, charging is an, a massive issue for us. Right now we have a charger at the uh, at our our testing facility in YVR that's capable of 60 kilowatts. So it takes about two to three hours to charge our existing battery bank because it's about 156 uh, kilowatt hour. Uh, our range, we can fly about 45 to 50 nautical miles, so we can make it to Salt Spring, Nanaimo, and here to downtown, but none of those locations have any charging available. The best charging we can do is to bring a, a portable 220 volt, 40 amp, seven kilowatt charger that takes 16 hours to charge the aircraft, which worked okay on our prior battery pack, but the battery pack we just installed this year went up to 800 volts and there are no small chargers that'll run off 220 volt 40 amp service single phase that'll go to 800 volts they top out at 750 volts so we we are struggling very much with charging it's one of part of our projects we are looking at installing 150 kilowatt chargers one here in downtown and one in Nanaimo so that we can charge the aircraft at least in three locations. But uh, yeah, charging is something that we're going to need a lot of support from the community to help uh, raise the charging infrastructure. And engineers watching us, because I know there are people who are in the EV industry and the charging industry who watch this. Please. Who, who <laughs> I'm, I'm sure could come and, and, and offer their expertise to you all to, to make this happen. We would absolutely welcome any assistance on the charging front. It's something that we have to look at as a community though, because we have um, electric, we have electric tugboats here. The High Sea has developed one. BC Ferries is looking at electrifying some of their fleet. So we're gonna need a lot of shore power, um, there are BC uh, TransLink is looking at buses. Coast Mountain is looking at electric buses. We all need to work together to figure out the charging. And that is something that while I would love to delve into it, this is my baby and I need somebody else to help me with the charging. <laughs> and I think that's really important to, 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 to kind of emphasize here. This is something that you've all led. It's not like someone's come to you and gone, hey, we've got an electric plane. Would you like to fly it? This is no, we want our planes to be electric. How do we go about doing that? Exactly. One of our problems from the get-go is everybody working in the in the uh, aviation world who's looking at electrification, they're looking at things like eVTOLs, like the vertical lift aircraft, or they're looking at clean builds. Nobody was looking at a retrofit, in particular for a seaplane operation. If we wanted to, to become a fully electric fleet, we were going to have to do it ourselves. And this just got back from Oshkosh. It did. She, uh, she got, we had to unfortunately put her in a container to get her there because there aren't very many lakes along the way. Um, but yes, we took her uh, for her first international uh, visit uh, to Oshkosh, which was absolutely amazing. Do you have any more trips planned in the future? Yes, hopefully, hoping that we can make it across the border and go visit our friends at Magniac soon. Excellent. It's, it's going to be great to see. Thank you so much, Erica, for spending time with us. And Here's hoping that, that, that the eBeaver has a wonderful future. And by the way, please offer a hug to, to my favorite 
little fluffy friend, Turbo. Absolutely. He's having a rest in the engineering office as we speak. We'll give him a hug when we get back. Perfect. Thanks for joining me today and if you've got thoughts make sure you leave them in our discord chat room our patreon page our youtube comment section or you can reach out to us on mastodon thanks to the amazing list of people scrolling by on your screen right now they are some of the more than 1500 people who help make this channel possible through patreon and youtube covering our bills paying our team and making sure that we can remain 100% independent. If you'd like to join them and see your name listed here, just follow the links below. There are a range of different tiers you can sign up for from as little as $1 a month, or if you pay yearly, around $10.08 a year. A massive welcome to our newest supporters, Bree Crockford, CAP, Christian Balal, Everything on a Buy Bagel, Pidge Eon, and Brett Chandler. To join the list and get your shout out, become a paid Patreon member for your moment of fame. If you'd like to support us with a one-off donation, you'll find links below for Ko-fi and Bitcoin donations. And we even have a good old fashioned PO box you can reach us at, the address for which you'll also find below. And if you're in need of some swag, do check out our swag store in the down below. We've got some fantastic content coming right up, so make sure you're subscribed on Peertube or YouTube, and we'll see you soon. As a reminder, we make new videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. If you want more, the almighty algorithm thinks you might enjoy this video, but what does it know? We think this one is also well worth a look. See you soon, and as always, keep evolving.